Disney Channel is known for doing a lot of things in their shows. Overarching love storylines, giving random characters the ability to sing so they can advertise the actors' music careers, and the occasional serious episode with a life lesson. But recently, I've seen a lot of memes making fun of when Disney sitcoms, and really just sitcoms in general I guess, would have guest stars on their episodes. Most of those jokes stem from the fact that there was always a loud applause followed by a long and awkward wait for the star of the episode to actually deliver their line. We've gotten some pretty iconic Disney Channel moments from some of these episodes, and with there being such a large amount of episodes to choose from, I decided to look back on some of them. I don't know, I just, I just thought it would be a fun idea, I guess. So sit back, relax, and grab a bowl of your favorite Kellogg cereal, because in today's video, we will be looking at and analyzing 8 different Disney Channel guest star episodes from Disney's history and seeing if they still hold up today. Just go into settings, switch off the Wi-Fi, and configure your VPN. VPN? Did you say VPN? <laughs> it's funny you should say that, because today's video is actually brought to you by Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN, aka Virtual Private Network, that hides everything that you do online for potential hackers and scammers. It provides you with the safety and security while browsing the internet that you both need and deserve. But not only can it do that, but it can also do some pretty fun stuff as well. Like, one of my favorite things to do is switch my location to somewhere else in the world and access shows and movies on services like Netflix that are not normally available in my country. Have you ever wanted to watch the Paw Patrol movie on Netflix? Well, just flip your VPN to Brazil and boom, there you go. Animation is cinema after all. <laughs> and one of my favorite things about it is the fact that you can also keep your device malware free using the Surfshark 1 package. And you can set it up so it notifies you about any potential credit card breaches, email breaches, or even ID breaches. It's pretty sick. Plus, if for whatever reason you feel like it's not your thing, don't worry, there is no risk of trying it. They offer a 30 day money back guarantee. You can use the promo code STALGIA to get an exclusive discount plus three months free. That's promo code STALGIA. STALGIA. And thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Okay, so first things first, I'd like to lay down a few ground rules and talk about my thought process while choosing these episodes. First of all, in this video, I am refusing to talk about Disney Channel episodes that simply guest star another actor, like Selena Gomez appearing on Sunny with a Chance or Vanessa Hudgens appearing on Sweet Life. Those episodes I don't count because like, well, they didn't have to do much to obtain those actors. Most of these shows were filmed right next to each other anyway. I'm also not going to be talking about actors appearing on shows before they were actually famous, like Victoria Justice or Jada Smith appearing on Sweet Life. Shouldn't really have to explain that one. I also was trying my hardest to avoid picking shows that I know virtually nothing about. It just seems like the obvious move. Like, I wanted to talk about the Frankie Muniz Lizzie McGuire episode, but I've never actually seen Lizzie McGuire, so it would be weird to have that episode be my introduction to the series, and then sit up here talking about the show like I actually know anything about it. So I really just wanted to watch a bunch of episodes of shows I was at least kind of familiar with so I can give you guys the best video possible. And don't worry, just because I didn't talk about a specific episode in this video doesn't mean I can't bring it up in another. I plan on doing more of these since there are so many guest star episodes of Disney shows. I may even do a Nickelodeon one, so sit tight. The only other thing I have to say is why in the world does Good Luck Charlie barely have any guest star episodes? The only guest stars that show had that were worth mentioning were Aisha Curry and The Muppets, and one of those was a dream sequence. Actually, both of them were dream sequences now that I think about it. Come on, man. But uh, yeah, without any further ado, let's get into our first guest star episode. And this one is an all-time classic. Next, hang out with Hannah. I mean, Miley. Uh, Hannah? Miley? Hannah Miley? Oh, I know. Hang out with Hannah and Miley on Hannah Montana, right here on Disney Channel. Hannah Montana. What is there to say about this show that hasn't already been said? Seriously. I mean, it's Hannah Montana. Admittedly, I really was into the show as a kid. I was too busy watching stuff like Sweet Life and... I don't know, as the bell rings. My only real exposure to this show when I was younger were the crossovers with Sweet Life and like this little toy phone that they used to have at Walmart that would play the music from the show. I never actually bought it. I just, I just like pressing the buttons. But I've had to watch quite a few different episodes of the show since I started uploading on this channel again. And it's grown on me just a little bit. And so I knew for a fact that I could not make a video about Disney Channel guest star episodes and not talk about Hannah Montana. So here we are. 
Now, choosing an episode to talk about for this show was super hard because this show had a lot of guest stars. The Rock, Larry David, Ray Romano, Ayaz, David Archuleta, Fred. I mean, come on. I can make a video about Hannah Montana guest star episodes alone. I mean, I'm not going to, but I definitely could. Eventually, I decided on doing the first episode of the Dolly Parton trilogy, as I call it, since she was on the show three times. But then, last minute, someone pointed out to me that Hannah Montana had an episode with the Jonas Brothers, and I totally forgot about that one. So we're gonna rock with that one instead. Sorry, Dolly. To make amends for what I did, I'll leave you up on a thumbnail. How about that? All right, this episode was not only a huge Hannah Montana episode, but it was also a huge Disney Channel episode in general. The season two episode entitled Me and Mr. Jonas and Mr. Jonas and Mr. Jonas aired on the network on August 17th, 2007, which if you didn't know, is arguably the biggest night in Disney Channel history. I didn't realize this until recently, but not only did High School Musical 2 premiere that night, Phineas and Ferb did too. It aired its pilot episode. And then, after that, was the premiere of the Hannah Montana episode we will be talking about today. But like, man, what an all-star lineup. Disney was cooking back then, man. Just for a little more backstory on this episode, it was filmed while Miley and Nick were dating, and I'm pretty sure their relationship is the only reason why this episode happened to begin with. And not only was it the highest rated Hannah Montana episode ever, but this episode also broke basic cable records with 10.8 million viewers and became basic cable's most watched series telecast ever, which is just nuts, all right? But was the episode worth all the hype? That's what we're about to find out right now. The episode begins with Hannah slash Miley waiting outside the recording booth with her dad, where she usually records her music. She gets impatient and charges through the door only to find out that the Jonas Brothers are the ones who were taking up all that studio time. So wait, my God's the Jonas Brothers! The Jonas Brothers get excited and quickly make their way over to her. They tell her that they're big fans, and with Nick, more or less admitting that he has a crush on her. Gee, I wonder what that was in reference to. The boys then realize that her dad is Robbie Way. Robbie... The boys then realize that her dad is Robbie Ray, the dude who writes all of Hannah's songs. The boys forget about Miley's existence and instead lose their minds over the presence of Bobby Flip, I mean Robbie Ray, and they ask him if he'd ever want to write a song for them, which Robbie happily agrees to do. And Miley isn't too thrilled by that news because she kind of just wants them to stick to writing songs for her. We then cut to the opening credits. Something I'm going to do for every show that I talk about theme song is discuss it and rate it on a scale of 1 to 5. And this show's theme song, I mean, I gotta, I, I, I gotta say, it's, it, it's a five. Like, it's not something that I'd unironically listen to, but it's objectively one of the most iconic Disney Channel theme songs of all time. And it honestly has one of the most iconic choruses of any theme song, period. Seriously, when do you ever hear someone bring up the phrase best of both worlds and not think about the show? It's impossible. Yeah, solid five. It's hard to top that one. I always wonder what she was laughing at. After we're serenaded with some iconic Hannah Montana transition music, we see Miley and Lily waiting for Robbie Ray to get home. A couple minutes later, he arrives and says that he was busy writing songs for the Jonas Brothers and got sidetracked. Miley gets a little jealous about all the time that he was spending with the brothers, but Robbie assures her that they were in fact getting a song done and weren't just goofing off. In the B-plot, Jackson and Rico are doing something on the beach. I don't I don't know, I wasn't really planning on covering the B-plots of these episodes since there's no guest stars in them, but yeah, so here you go. In the next scene, Miley, while dressed up as a boy, interrupts her dad's jamming session. She sits next to him and starts acting like a dude. Since her dad loves hanging around the Jonas Brothers so much, she thinks that in order to start getting some more attention, she needs to start acting like a dude herself. And like, I don't know, I feel like she's too old to be thinking like this. She's like, what, a freshman in high school? Maybe this is just how Miley acts in this show, but a girl dressing up as a dude so her dad would want to spend more time with her is something I'd expect from, like, season three Stephanie Tanner, not a teenager. But I've also never been a 14-year-old girl before, so maybe I'm just missing something. While on the phone with the Jonas Brothers, Robbie agrees to stop by their studio to continue working on their song. Miley starts to get really jealous by this. There's a line where she says she's not about to let Larry, Curly, and Mo Bro get in between her and her dad, which is a reference to the Three Stooges, but like, I'm not sure how many kids actually got that reference. And then we fade to commercial. Stick around. Hannah Montana will be right back on Disney Channel. 
Now let's get back to Hannah Montana on Disney Channel. Miley and Lily come up with a plan that involves making the Jonas Brothers believe that the song that Robbie Ray is writing for them actually originated from another artist. So they pull up to the studio dressed as male artists to tell the trio that Robbie actually stole the song from them. The brothers arrive with marshmallow shooters to come up with a plan to prank Robbie Ray. One really small issue that I have with this episode is that they kind of just wrote all of the Jonas Brothers as one character. What I mean is, there's nothing separating Nick, Joe, or Kevin personality-wise. They literally all act the same, which is kind of odd considering, at least in real life, there's a decent age gap between all of them, so there's no reason for Kevin, the oldest, to act like Nick, the youngest. One day, I actually plan on reviewing the actual Jonas Brothers show that aired on Disney, so I'm curious to see if they continue with the style of writing, or do they actually do more to make the three brothers stand out from each other. They come into the studio firing on all cylinders, only to realize that they're not shooting at Robbie Ray. Instead, they're shooting at two dudes that, if we're being real, look exactly like Miley and Lily, but I guess I'll just apply sitcom logic to this. The girls tell the bros that their names are Milo and Otis, a reference to the movie The Adventures of Milo and Otis. They perform the song that Robbie wrote for the Jonas Brothers, which causes the brothers to confront Milo and Otis and ask why they were performing their song. The girls, or dudes I guess, explain that Robbie didn't write the song, and instead he stole it from them while they were rehearsing. They tell Milo and Otis that it's their song and they can keep it. On their way out though, they meet up with Robbie Ray and start chewing him out, which leads to the girls getting caught. That night, Robbie Ray goes up to Miley and the two of them talk about the whole Jonas Brothers thing. Robbie tells her that although he does enjoy working with the Jonas Brothers, he'll always prefer working with his daughter. Then he says to make up for the past few days, he's going to allow Miley to sing the song he had been writing for the Jonas Brothers with them. And that's how the episode ends. I can't play the song because I'll definitely get copyright claim for it, but yeah, it's all right. So my first reaction after I finished this episode was, where in the world was Mitchell Musso's character? I feel like we should have had an Oliver cameo in this episode. Obviously, I realized he probably just wasn't available to shoot this episode for whatever reason, but I still wish we could have gotten to see his character interact with the Jonas Brothers. As for the episode itself, eh, it was alright. I've seen better Hannah Montana episodes, to be real with you. I understand the uh, cultural significance, I guess, of this episode, but quality-wise, I do feel like it's kind of just mid. It's not bad, I just feel like the Dolly Parton episode, for instance, was a much better handled guest star episode, and just a better written episode in general. One thing I never really understood, though, was why they didn't use this episode of Hannah Montana as a backdoor pilot to a Jonas Brothers show. You have this gigantic episode that does amazing numbers on the channel, yet you don't immediately put a series set in the same continuity as Hannah Montana in production that could have had a million different crossovers with not only that show, but potentially even Sweet Life and the other Disney Channel sitcoms as well. And instead, we got Jonas, a show that lasted two seasons and is rarely ever talked about nowadays. Disney kind of fumbled the bag on this one, honestly, but... Yeah, going back to the episode, it was decent. I'd, I'd rate it a solid 6.5 out of 10, maybe 6.8. Moving on to the next show. Next, Mosby checks you in, but Zach and Cody help you check out. <laughs> in a hurry. The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody on Disney Channel. Sweet Life has had a lot of different guest star episodes throughout the course of its run, but I wanted to use this time to talk about the original series since I have a few videos planned about On Deck. The Sweet Life episode in question today is one that I'm sure you guys remember relatively well, the Jesse McCartney episode. For those unfamiliar with Jesse McCartney, he's the voice of Dick Grayson in Young Justice and Theodore in the live-action Alvin and the Chipmunks movies. Oh yeah, he was also like a famous singer in the 2000s too. The episode begins with a bunch of screaming girls gathering outside the Tipton, waiting for the arrival of Jesse McCartney, who Carrie mistakes for Paul McCartney. Jesse manages to find his way into the hotel and asks London where the manager's office is. After doing a double take, she realizes that she just spoke to Mr. McCartney himself and passes out. Okay, theme song time. Yeah, this one's a banger. A classic, even. One of Dizzy's very best. Uh, I'll give it a four. I'll give it a four. So the B plot for this episode focuses around Arwen teaming up with Cody to help him with his school science project. Like I said, I won't really be covering the B plots in this video, but just thought I'd acknowledge it. Shout out Brian Stepanek though, he's the GOAT. 
ein Buttertoast? Maddie wants to get a picture of Jesse for her school newspaper, and Lunda promises that she'll be able to get them both in the room where he's rehearsing due to the fact that she and Jesse are both celebrities. And that made me think about something. I feel like there have been several times throughout the series where the writers just kind of forgot that London is a celebrity, because like you'd think that she'd constantly get approached by people all the time asking for autographs and photos, but in the movie for instance, she's walking around in public without a single person stopping her. Her level of fame just kind of fluctuates depending on who's writing the episode, I guess. Mosby catches the two girls and forbids them from entering Jesse's rehearsal room so they have to come up with a plan to sneak in. The girls start fangirling over Jesse, something Maddie wasn't even doing in this episode until she heard him sing. As part of his rehearsal, Jesse performs his hit song, Beautiful Soul, and the girls start, well, yeah. Mosby checks in on McCartney after his rehearsal and asks him if everything went all right and if there were any issues with screaming girls, to which McCartney responds with no, but does point out that there were a few screaming waiters. And that's when London and Maddie do the dash. Also, Maddie never actually took a pic of McCartney for her school newspaper. I guess she forgot. So later, they try to sneak into his hotel room, unbeknownst to each other that they'd be doing it at the same time. When the handle of the bathroom door starts to jiggle, the girls quickly hide under his bed. When the maid walks out of the bathroom and leaves the hotel room, the girls begin to fight over Jesse's robe, which leads to it ripping. But then, Zack swoops in out of nowhere and grabs both pieces. Turns out he's been selling some of Jesse's stuff to girls on the street and making bank while doing it. You know, this episode has been so entertaining so far, I didn't even notice that Zack, one of the best characters in the series, wasn't really in it for the first 10 minutes. I realized I made a mistake while making the script. He was in it, he was literally in the first scene, but then he wasn't in anything after the intro. So I'm acknowledging the mistake now, before I go out of comments correcting me, I apologize. Truly. Trouble occurs when Mosby and Jesse are heard making their way back to Jesse's hotel room. Will Maddie and London make it out in time, or have they finally been caught? Find out when the sweet life of Zach and Cody returns from a brief commercial break. Don't check out. The sweet life of Zach and Cody will be back on Disney Channel. New Crush Cups. Check it out. I crush the alien. <laughs> well, I crush the director. <laughs> I crush the tiki. <laughs> I crush a Danimals Crush Cup. Huh? Yeah, new Danimals Crush Cups. You crush it and slurp it. Mmm, cool. No spoon? Nope. Just crush and slurp for a blast of fruity flavor. Mmm, awesome. <laughs> I crush you crushing a Danimals Crush Cup. New Danimals Crush Cups. Danimals, get your blast on. Sweet. We're back with the sweet life of Zack and Cody. We're back from the commercial break and it appears that the three managed to escape in time. Nope, just kidding. They snuck under Jesse's bed. Jesse enters his bathroom and finds out that there aren't any towels, so Mosby leaves to get some himself. While Jesse is in the bathroom, the three get out from under Jesse's bed and try to make an escape. Back at the hotel room, the trio go through some of the items stolen from Jesse's room. They realize that they need to return Jesse's bracelet back to him since he never performs without it and might sing poorly as a result of its absence. So they come up with a plan to deliver it back to him, which involves sneaking back into his hotel room while he's taking a nap. Also, Maddie still hasn't taken a picture of him yet, but London actually does. Jesse rolls over in his sleep and pulls Maddie close to him. Zack and Maddie fall and London opens the blinds exposing the daylight to Jesse's room. This causes him to wake up and question what's going on. Maddie and London somehow manage to escape while Zack is left in the hotel room. The guards are about to carry him away until he mentions that his actions were nearly as bad as his two wacky friends actions. Jesse stops the guards from pulling Zack away after he finds out that he was hanging with girls that were three years older than him. And the episode ends with the two blonde haired fellows bonding over video games. London and Maddie start asking questions intended for Jesse through the door. Maddie wants to know his favorite color for her article, whereas London is just trying to convince Jesse into marrying her. And that concludes an extremely solid episode of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. I like this episode a lot actually. I wasn't feeling the B-plot just because of how detached it was from the main story, but everything about it was, for the most part, pretty solid. London, Maddie, and Zack were an underrated trio that I kinda wish we saw more of in the show. Jesse McCartney was good in this episode as well, 
Seems like a pretty solid dude, I guess. I definitely rank this episode higher than the Hannah Montana episode with a solid 8 out of 10. I do kind of wish we saw more of Zack and Cody together, and I feel like Maddie was written slightly out of character for this episode, but for a guest star episode, it did just about everything that it needed to do. Good job, Sweet Life Writers. Now on to the next show. Next, they're cute, they're loud, and they got it going on. The Proud Family's heading your way on Disney Channel. The Proud Family. What? I wanted to include at least one animated series in this video, and although I did have some interesting choices like the Ben Stiller episode from Phineas and Ferb, I wanted to use this video to talk about shows that I'll probably never get a chance to talk about again. And I mean, I think Proud Family is a good show, but it didn't really leave much of an impact on me as a kid. I just didn't watch it a lot. But it's too iconic of a series to just not talk about on my channel, so consider this the first and last time I talk about Proud Family. Now, Proud Family is a show that has a lot, and I mean a lot, of great guest star episodes. But the episode I will be talking about today is the one that features Alicia Keys, Randy Jackson, not to be confused with Randy Jackson, and Tim Curry. What an elite guest star roster. Honestly, Proud Family's regular cast is so stacked to the brim with talent, you could argue that every episode is a guest star episode. It's insane. But uh, yeah, the episode starts with Wizard Kelly introducing everyone to the Tween Idol auditions, which is basically the Proud Family's version of American Idol. Penny and her friends are watching a video explaining that the winner of the competition will win a bunch of different prizes such as a recording contract, a movie deal, and an opportunity to sing with Alicia Keys. La Cienega is very excited by this news because Alicia Keys is her idol. But then, Sugar Mama barges through the door and says that Alicia Keys has nothing on her and cuts the line so she can audition next. She's about to perform until Tim Curry's character, who is definitely supposed to be a reference to Simon Cowell, makes a joke about her age. She then assaults him with a cane in response, and we roll straight into the intro. 5 out of 5, by the way. There are not many Disney Channel intros as good as a Proud Family intro. But, I mean, that's what you get when you've got Disney's Child and Solange doing the music. It's gonna come out fire. Back to the auditions, several members of the Proud Family friend group audition for the competition, but all of them get turned out by Tim Curry's character Percival. So fun fact, I'm a really big fan of the show Psych, it's one of my favorite shows. There's one episode called American Duos that also features Tim Curry playing a fake Simon Cowell, although the Psych episode didn't come out until a few years later. I don't know, I just thought it was kind of funny. La Cienega performs and all the judges including Alicia Keys and Randy Jackson are into it, so much so that they let her know that she has moved on to the next round. Alicia, what does Randy got to do to get a date with you? What does Randy got to do to get a date with you? Woo! He does this the entire episode, by the way, and it's hilarious. La Cienega tells the group the good news, and they're all pretty shocked by it. Later at school, it gets announced that La Cienega isn't the only one from that school moving on to the next round. Another girl named Agatha Ordinario managed to move on as well. Wow, that's messed up. She comes over to congratulate La Cienega, but La Cienega makes a few more crude remarks before leaving the lunch table so she could write her acceptance speech. Man, I don't even think Angelica from All Grown Up was this mean. Baby Angelica, on the other hand, totally was though. I mean, have y'all seen Rugrats in Paris? The next day, Agatha performs and does an amazing job, and is praised by both Randy Jackson and Alicia Keys. Percival, on the other hand, says that although she did a good job singing, at the end of the day, the show is called Tween Idol, meaning that she should be someone that a kid would want to look up to, and considering her looks, she does not fit the part, and that makes her tear up. But because of the fact that the crowd votes and not the judges, Agatha still gets to move on to the next round, along with La Cienega. The Proud Family will be right back on Toon Disney. We're back with the Proud Family on Toon Disney. During the next round, La Cienega puts on another good performance. Alicia, Percival, and Randy tell her that she did a great job. But Agatha's performance blows La Cienega's out the water, and everyone knows it, even Percival. But La Cienega still ends up winning anyway, which surprises everyone. Penny expresses her concerns to her friends, but they all kind of brush it off. Just then, a mysterious hand ushers Penny over to them. Turns out that Mysterious Hand ended up belonging to Brian Dunkelman, 
and he tells Penny that the contest was actually rigged and hands her a floppy disk with proof on it. Sticky works his magic and goes through the files on the disk, and it turns out that Agatha actually won by a wide margin. So they run to Wizard Kelly to present him the floppy disk containing the actual votes. He pulls out a contract, claiming that people like him, aka producers, are allowed to change the outcome of polls if the outcome doesn't, and I quote, suit his fancy. He tells Penny that pretty sells and ugly repels, so he changed the outcome to La Cienega's favor because she'll end up being the more profitable market due to her being prettier than Agatha. He then deletes all the files on the disc and breaks it in half. Penny and Sticky's only other option is to visit La Cienega before she gets on stage using a classic Muppet Man disguise. Or Orlando Blue, whichever one you prefer. Penny explains to her the situation and La Cienega doesn't really believe her, but says even if she did, there would be no way she'd give up what's about to come to her. So before she goes on stage, Penny gives her one last piece of her mind. But you know what, La Cienega? For all it's worth, I'm looking at you right now and I've never seen anyone uglier. <gasps> the sound editors forgot to like, add sound effects when she walked away and it really bothered me. So I just wanted to point it out. Someone hands Brian a note from Wizard Kelly saying that he knows that he's the one who gave the floppy disk to Penny. So someone, presumably who works for Mr. Kelly, six their dogs on Brian and I'm just now finding out that Brian Dunkelman is a real person who worked on American Idol back in the day. So that's four guest stars, I guess. Alicia and La Cienega are about to perform together, but then La Cienega comes to her senses and says that she doesn't deserve to win this award because of the fact that it was rigged. Instead, it belongs to Agatha. So the two hug it out and start singing together and they all live happily ever after especially since La Cienega and Agatha get to be in Alicia Keys' next music video. And uh, yeah, that's how the episode ends. A really solid episode of The Proud Family, if I do say so myself. I feel like this is one of those Proud Family episodes that truly made the show special. Not many cartoons could do a plot like this, seriously. And I thoroughly enjoyed watching it. I'll, I'll give it an 8 out of 10. Good stuff, man. Still not doing a video on it, though. <laughs> Disney Channel. Yeah. My name is Bella Thorne, and this is the story of the time I found out I have dyslexia. I remember when I started first grade. Right away, it was awful because I couldn't read as well as the other kids. My brain mixed up letters like B and D and M and W. Dyslexia is different for everyone who has it. For me, it just makes it harder to read or write. I started working really hard on how to read better. My family helped me by making me read everything from menus to cereal boxes to road signs. Today, I read a year above my grade level and I learned to face problems, not run away from them. Dyslexia makes things hard for me, but not impossible. You just watched a TTI on Disney Channel. Uh, I don't, I don't particularly enjoy Shake It Up. I mean, I used to watch it, but I don't think I was ever getting any real enjoyment out of it. For those that are familiar with the premise of Shake It Up, Cece and Rocky, played by Bella Thorne and Zendaya, are dancers in the hit TV series Shake It Up Chicago. Although, like any Disney series centered around some sort of gimmick, I would say maybe only half of their episodes have something to do with dancing. Maybe less? I, I, I don't know. I haven't really seen this show in a while, I could be completely wrong. This is another one that I'll probably never make a video on because I don't think I'll be able to sit through all three seasons to be real with you. So, here it is folks, the first and last time I'll talk about Shake It Up on my channel, probably. The episode we will be talking about today is Season 3, Episode 10, My Fair Librarian It Up. Oh yeah, I forgot they ended every episode with the same two words, it was, it was one of those kind of shows. The episode starts right off the bat with the celebrity of the episode, Carly Rae Jepsen. Yup, this episode was 2013 alright. I was gonna do a quick explanation on who she is, but like, unless you're a toddler, you should already know. Call Me Maybe was like the biggest pop song in the world at one point. You couldn't go anywhere without hearing it. And Good Time was a banger too, shout out Owl City. So it makes sense why Disney would want to make an episode centered around her. But the thing is, it's not. It's not centered around her. She says hello to Rocky, 
gets on stage and performs her song Sweetie, which apparently in the main Disney Channel universe was a big hit, even though it didn't crack the Billboard Top 100. And then boom, you get hit with the intro. So why am I still talking about this episode? Just keep watching because it might blow your mind just like it blew mine. But first, we have to talk about the intro to Shake It Up. Shake It Up's theme song is pretty decent. I won't say it's a banger, it's, it's, it's more like a bop, if anything, which I think ranks below a banger, but I mean, it's still, it's still, pr do I even want to know the context of this? All right, anyway, it's still pretty good. I like it. Shout out speaking to Gomez for doing it. 3.5 out of five. I just remembered. Y'all remember when they kicked this dude out the show during that Made in Japan episode? <laughs> That was crazy. Anyway, CC and Rocky are in the school library talking about how Rocky apparently left Shake It Up Chicago. What? I guess I'm not caught up on my Shake It Up lore because I have no memory of this. So from my understanding, the Shake It Up Chicago building burned down and when it was rebuilt, it was under new management. And because of that, they had to rehire everyone. And Rocky was not one of the people that got rehired. Wow, I mean, all right, that's cool, I guess. Anyway, back to the episode. Rocky and Cece are organizing the books in the library when they come across Miss Burke, the school librarian that is played by Tyra Banks. This isn't even the first time she was on the show, apparently. She's crying because she's in love with Mr. Zigfield, the school poetry teacher, despite the fact that they've never actually spoken. She knows everything about him because of his library checkout record. But now that he has an e-reader, he never stops at the library anymore, so she hasn't seen him in a while. So Rocky and Cece agree to help her out and give her relationship advice. In the B-plot, little boy, Rashawn Fagan, and other guy are working on a car for a soapbox derby. They get a knock on the door and Leo Howard from Kicking It walks in! How many guest stars are in this episode? Wait, hold on. Kale is my homeboy? Is that a pun? Is why? Out of all the shirts they could have chosen for this character, they picked the one that says Kale is my homeboy. So Leo Howard plays a character named Logan, who is little boy's soon to be stepbrother. I kind of vaguely remember his character. I'm not covering the B plots in this video, but I did kind of think it was funny that so far they've technically had three guest stars in this episode. Cece and Rocky are back in the library helping out their teacher when it's discovered that when she gets nervous, she shushes people because she's a librarian and librarians shush people. So they try to help her stop with shushing to prepare her for when she actually approaches Mr. Zigfield. And thanks to some exercises, they were able to do just that. So she begins to celebrate while the fake studio audience laughs like you're sitting front row at a Bernie Mac show. Okay, so here's something that I don't quite get. Why are Cece and Rocky and everybody else in school while well, these three aren't. Did they all get the day off to build the car or were the writers just forgetful? Maybe they explain it in the episode actually, but I'm not trying to rewind this one. I value my mental health too much. The girls are hyping up Miss Burke to approach Mr. Zigfield and you'll never guess who is playing him. Alfonso Ribeiro from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. We kind of have a Fresh Prince reunion a little bit. In my Disney Channel Multiverse video, I mentioned that there were a lot of 90s sitcoms in the same universe as the Disney sitcoms, but Fresh Prince was not one of those shows. So it's kind of funny that no matter what universe your TV show takes place in, Tyra Banks and Alfonso Ribeiro will somehow manage to always find each other. Despite all the training that she had received, Miss Burke freaks out when she sees him and runs away. Yeah, yeah she couldn't do it. <laughs> You have what it takes to rock it like the dancers on Disney Channel's hit series, Shake It Up? Well, there's only one way to find out. Now you can make your mark by auditioning for Disney Channel's first ever dance competition. And if you're selected, you'll have a chance to appear as a feature dancer on Shake It Up. Go to DisneyChannel.com slash make your mark for complete procedures and the latest news about this once in a lifetime opportunity. You could be dancing with us. It's Disney Channel's Make Your Mark, the ultimate dance off, Shake It Up edition. Shake it up and make your mark. We're back to Shake It Up on Disney Channel. The girls give Miss Burke a makeover, and while waiting for the new and improved version of her to come out of the bathroom, the girls start arguing about how Rocky secretly misses being on Shake It Up. But we don't really care about that because Miss Burke walks out of the bathroom, and yeah, she just looks like Tyra Banks now. The girls call up Carlton and hand the phone to Tyra Banks, 
and she starts freaking out because of how nervous she is. But after looking at herself in the mirror for what is implied to be the first time even though she was just in the bathroom that presumably had a mirror, she feels much more confident in herself and successfully leaves a voicemail. The girls get really excited and Tyra Banks walks out of the apartment as Jack, Rashawn Fagan, and other guy make Tex Avery wolf faces and follow her. That was the funniest thing in the entire episode. Later, we see the girls at the pizza shop with their now hot librarian as she prepares to make her way over to the host of America's Funniest Home Videos. You know, they picked a really good show to have Tyra Banks guest star in. Tyra, especially in the heels, still ended up towering over both girls, but imagine how weird it would have been if she was standing next to the cast of Ant Farm instead. That would look insane. Hannah Montana, the movie star Tyra Banks, talks to the things we do for love star Alfonso Ribeiro as the camera pans back over to CC and Rocky talking about Rocky leaving Shake It Up. I don't care about this. Alfonso gets up and leaves after Tyra does the Batusi. Yeah, I'd probably do the same thing. Turns out Carlton actually loved the old Eve the doll and is weirded out by the new one. When she overhears this, Carlton confirms that he liked her just the way she was but was just too scared to contact her because he thought she was out of his league. Anyway, he reads a poem, she likes the poem, they start doing weird stuff, then run upstairs, and the A-plot is wrapped up. Oh, and in case you were wondering, they do end up building the car, but it's too big to fit through the door because I guess all four of these characters are idiots. Yeah. Yeah, so this episode is like, really bad. And see, some Disney shows like Hannah Montana or even Sweet Life might be able to get away with a bad episode because the characters for the most part are pretty likable. But I truly dislike basically every character in this episode. I mean, I never ever cared for the two girls in general. To me, they just felt like a discount Carly and Sam. I mean, I guess Rocky isn't all that similar to Carly, but Cece is definitely Sam, just not as abusive. I don't think Shake It Up has aged very well. I don't think it was ever actually good, to be honest, and I'm sorry if that upsets anyone that grew up liking the show, but besides a pretty decent theme song, the show really doesn't have any redeeming qualities. I'll take Casey Undercover over Shake It Up any day. This episode gets a 2 out of 10. It was worse than mid. It was just straight up boring. Next show, please. The kids may be a handful, but she's the nanny with the planning. It's Jesse on Disney Channel Summer. So, normally what I've been doing in this video so far is talking about one episode per section but we're actually going to change it up this time around. Reason being is because these two episodes are actually kind of connected with each other. On June 28th, 2013, Disney Channel premiered two new episodes. One of them was an episode of Jesse, and the other was of Ant Farm. The reason why these episodes are linked though is because they were both made, for whatever reason, to promote the film Grown Ups 2. And so since both China and McLean and Cameron Boyce were in that movie, they decided to have Adam Stamler appear in Jesse and Chris Rock appear in Afon. Now this section will likely still end up being the same length as a normal one despite me talking about the two episodes instead of one because I'm only going to summarize the bits of the episode that lead to the cameos of the two celebrities. Starting off, we have the season two Jesse episode, Punch Dumped Love, a reference to an Adam Sandler movie that I've never seen. First of all, just so I can get this out the way, the Jesse theme song is actually horrible. From the annoying lyrics to the overuse of autotune, it's truly one of the worst Disney Channel theme songs ever. One out of five. In the episode, Luke has a crush on this girl named Rachel and successfully asks her to the dance after she murders Robbie with a dodgeball. Only thing is, this makes Rachel's ex-boyfriend mad. In the B-plot, Bertram dies. Back to the A-plot, Luke gives Rachel a rose and she stuffs it in her little baby purse. I don't know what it's called, I'm sorry. Luke starts to get nervous, so he walks over to get some punch and that's when we see Adam Sandler just kind of standing there. There's literally nobody around him. Nobody is addressing that Adam Sandler is, for whatever reason, at a middle school dance. Adam gives some advice to Luke about how you should never back away from a girl, but the way he's delivering the line makes it seem like he really does not want to be there at the dance. This is actually a reference to Adam Sandler being on the set of Jesse. He also says that he's just trying to pick up some spare change chaperoning, which I honestly can't tell if that was supposed to be a joke or not. If we have to have grown-ups too, I'm glad it's you. <laughs> oh, kill me now! Sandler tells Luke that from now on we should call him Thunder because it just sounds cooler. Do you guys think Sandler wrote his lines for this or did some Disney Channel writer just do it for him? 
because a lot of this dialogue just sounds like stuff Adam Sandler would say if someone had kidnapped the real Adam Sandler and tried to impersonate him. He offers Luke some final words of advice, saying that when it comes to girls, you only need to be three things, polite, honest, and a movie star. He sends it back on his way, but not before giving him two cups of punch that Sandler made himself. He said that he made it in Kevin James's bathtub. Funny thing is, Kevin James actually does appear in an episode of Liv and Maddie, a show that crosses over with Jesse later in the future. But he doesn't actually play Kevin James, he plays a chef, which means that there are two versions of Kevin James that exist in the Disney Channel Earth Prime. For more on weird connections like this, please check out my Disney Channel Multiverse video. Seriously, like watch it, it's a pretty good video in my opinion. Later in the episode, Jesse ends up meeting Adam Sam, I mean Thunder as well. And that's when we get the iconic scene that everyone has made jokes about. What are you doing here? Waiting for them to play Gangnam Style. She asks for some acting advice, and Thunder reveals that in order to have a successful career, she must show up on time, know all her lines, and whenever possible, do this. <laughs> Jesse also tries to punch and gags. This punch is horrible. Yeah, that's Kevin James speed you're tasting. For what it's worth, I actually did watch this entire episode and it truly wasn't that bad. For an episode of Jesse at least. Adam Sandler somehow actually ended up being one of the least interesting things about the episode, even with his iconic Gangnam Style joke. I was expecting him to be the one saving grace, but I was pleasantly surprised with this episode. It's a shame they had to kill off Bertram though, he was like one of the only good characters from this show. I would give this episode a 5 out of 10. It has more charm than the Shake It Up one at least. Moving on to Ant Farm. Ant Farm is one of the few Disney Channel shows from this era that I actually look back on pretty favorably. I recently watched some episodes from season 1 and it still holds up surprisingly well. They did do this weird thing in season 3 though where they decided to put the ants in a fancy boarding school that was funded by a millionaire named Zoltan instead of keeping them in their normal school setting. I had stopped watching Disney Channel around this time but I do have some memory of this season including this episode. But before we get into the episode, it's time to rate the theme song. The Ant Farm theme song is very solid. I'd probably put it at a solid 3.5 out of 5. China remains one of the best singers Disney has ever had. Basically, the plot of this episode is as follows. There's a zoologist at the school that the ants go to named Seth, and he's recently discovered a new species of animal called a Papa Nuala, a hybrid of a... Well, yeah. China wants to own one. So in order to prove to Seth that she's responsible enough to take care of one, she agrees to watch over all of Seth's animals while he's out rescuing a bald eagle. Everything is going smoothly until China gets emotionally attached to a chicken that is supposed to be fed to an alligator. So to avoid having to feed the chicken to the alligator, Fletcher comes up with an idea to feed it to an uncooked chicken, and the poorly green screen alligator isn't very amused. So Fletcher instead decides to feed the alligator one of the other chickens in the school. But as it turns out, the chicken that he fed the alligator to was actually a duck because Fletcher is an idiot and apparently doesn't know the difference between a chicken and a duck. That's incredibly racist by the way, I take full offense to that. The duck that Fletcher fed to the alligator is actually the world's only talking duck, a scientific miracle that Seth discovered. Fletcher finds another duck so they can trick Seth into thinking that this is actually the talking duck. In the B-plot, Paisley, Lexi's best friend from the first two seasons, this is Lexi at the new school. Can I just say, I genuinely believe that she is the dumbest live action character from any children's sitcom. Like she, I don't even understand how she's made it this far without seriously injuring herself. Back to the A plot, China is trying her best to teach the duck English and you'll never guess what happens next. Please talk to me. How did you know Kevin James's pickup line? <laughs> Let's pretend for a second that this episode of Ant Farm and the Jesse episode with Adam Sandler are happening around the same time. I think it's very funny that for whatever reason, both actors are visiting random schools around the US just to make fun of Kevin James. I'd like to imagine that those lines specifically were made up by the two actors on the day of shooting. Chris is there to ask Seth if he can adopt a puppy Nuala for his daughter because she is just dying to have one. So China tells Chris that she'll put in a good word with Seth if he agrees to help him teach the duck English, so naturally, Chris does. Olive walks in, and Chris makes a joke while hiding and pretending to be the duck. When Olive doesn't fall for it, 
Chris reveals himself and Olive freaks out. I love how whenever a celebrity is on a sitcom, every single character is a big fan of them. Seth comes back and isn't even phased by Chris Rock being in the same room as him. I guess maybe he's the one character that isn't a Chris Rock fan. Also, is it just me or does Seth look like DJ's boyfriend from Full House? Huh, that's two Full House references in this video. It's interesting. Seth notices that Daphne isn't herself, and as the gang tries to make up excuses as to why she's not talking, Seth tells them that Daphne isn't actually a talking duck. She knows how to respond to things using quacks, but she can't actually speak English. Because she's a duck. And China, I guess, didn't realize that ducks physically can't speak. And you'd think Olive, being the smart one, would have tried explaining this to China, but she, she didn't. Got into the plot along somehow, I guess. As it turns out, Daphne is still alive and well. When Fletcher put her in the alligator cage, she somehow managed to escape. China apologizes for lying and Seth forgives her. He also tells her that she can have a Papa Nuala if she wants. The only thing she has to know is that they feed off human flesh. So she passes on the offer. And the episode ends with Chris asking the duck if he's funnier than Adam Sandler and the duck quacks once, which means yes. And I am now realizing that I should have talked about this episode first because this would have been a great segue into the Jesse episode, but oh well. This episode of Ant Farm definitely isn't one of my favorites. The characters are written dumber than usual for the sake of the plot, and it overall just wasn't a very entertaining episode. But because of the fact that the characters in this show are still for the most part pretty likable, it wasn't as bad of a watch as the Shake It Up episode. So I'm willing to give this one a 4 out of 10. They hit all the right notes and strike all the right chords. Austin and Allie is coming up next on Disney Channel Sunday Night. So, when I was making this video, I knew that I wanted to do an episode of Austin and Allie. And I knew exactly which one, too. I wanted to do the episode featuring Rick Ross. Huh. And although I don't remember the episode exactly, I do remember it existing. But come to find out, there is no Austin and Alley episode featuring Rick Ross. I searched long and hard for it because I just knew for a fact that it existed, but it doesn't. My brain made it up for some reason. And, and I don't know why either. I think maybe what had happened is that Rick Ross is from Miami and Austin and Alley takes place in Miami. So I just automatically leaked them together. But, uh... Yeah, instead we're going to review the episode with future Basketball Hall of Famer, Dwayne Wade. This, this should be a fun one. The episode starts off with Austin rehearsing for a performance. The audience starts cheering even though all he did was do the most generic boy band spin of all time. He tells his crew that he's trying to perfect this performance because he will be live streaming it to all of his international fans. Meanwhile, Trish is struggling with a problem of her own. Her boyfriend Jace, who she interacts with only through the use of the internet, is frozen. But he does end up unfreezing just in time to tell Austin that he did a good job with his performance. Pretty sure this is set up for the B-plot of the episode, so I'm just going to skim her over this. But basically, Trish and Jace are having a hard time keeping a long-distance relationship. Dez informs the gang that his cousin Dwayne invited them over to come over to his house, claiming he is the biggest Austin Moon fan. Austin is hesitant at first because he has a lot of work to get done but does eventually agree. And we cut to the theme song, which I gotta say, is a really good one. A solid 4 out of 5 in my opinion. After the intro, the gang pulls up to Cousin Dwayne's house as they're greeted by a rather grumpy butler named Bogues. When they're let in, Dwayne Wade makes his appearance and greets the group. Turns out, Dwayne Wade is Des Wade's half-cousin-in-law twice removed. And apparently, up until this point, they never actually reveal Dez's last name in the show. Which to me says that they always had a plan to have some sort of big reveal episode for his last name, even if they didn't know at the time what they wanted it to be. And honestly, it's kind of funny that it took them three seasons to explain what it was. It's also funny that Dez has known Austin for like a really long time and he just never mentioned that his cousin is Dwayne Wade. From what I remember of the show, it is incredibly in character for him to do that. He was always the weird and zany one. He was basically a discount Luther from Zeke and Luther. Anyway, Dwayne starts fangirling over Austin and invites him and Des to play a video game. Allie is creeped out by Dwayne's weird obsession with Austin and decides to play detective to see what Dwayne is really up to. She goes through his bookshelf and finds out that Dwayne has been changing all of the book covers to make them about Austin. 
He also somehow managed to print out a PNG of the show's logo in order to do so. She tries to explain to Trish about how all of this is weird and doesn't make any sense, but Trish is blindsided by all of this due to her massive crush on Dwayne. The boys finish their 37th round of the video game Dance Explosion, and the butler informs Dwayne that his phone interview is all set up. So, Des and Austin decide it's time to leave, but Dwayne stops them. Why you wait on me? Bowls can make your favorite snacks. Pancakes! Dwayne might actually be one of the worst sports actors of all time. Even Isaiah Thomas gave a better performance when he was on Nicky Ricky Dicky and Dawn. Don't ask me why I know that Isaiah Thomas was on Nicky Ricky Dicky and Dawn. I'm good. They agree to stay for the pancakes, and while they're waiting for them to arrive, Ali says that she found creepy Austin Moon trophies that Dwayne Wade made himself. The pancakes arrive, and wow, these are the worst looking pancakes of all time. If this is what D. Wade was eating during his final years in the NBA, then no wonder why his stats progressively got worse. Ali shows Austin all the creepy stuff that Dwayne did, and he agrees that it's starting to get really weird. But after saying that, he accidentally stumbles upon a secret shine filled with more Austin Moon stuff, and everyone is pretty horrified. We then cut to commercial. Keep rocking! Austin and Ali will be right back on Disney Channel. Drumroll! We're back with Austin and Ally on Disney Channel. The gang try to make their way out of the house, but get stopped by Bogues the butler. In order to escape, Ally suggests that they play hide and seek, and makes Bogues count to 50, allowing them to make their sweet escape. They head back to the music store, which is called Sonic Boom, and Dwayne somehow manages to follow them. Ally leaving the store unsupervised makes me question something that I've never actually thought about when it comes to the show. Who exactly works at Sonic Boom? Who was watching the store when Ali was gone? Are there any other employees at Sonic Boom? We know for a fact that Ali and her dad are the two main employees there with her dad being the manager. We also know that Trish is not allowed to work at Sonic Boom due to her bad history with jobs and Austin and Dez never actually officially get hired either. There are two other characters named Dallas and Carrie that serve short stints at the store as did Kira Starr, who was Austin's love interest for a little bit. But throughout the show, it appears that Ali and her dad are the only two employees that consistently worked at Sonic Boom, which again, makes me wonder who was watching the store while Ali was gone. You could argue that since it appears to be nighttime when the gang walks in, the store was probably closed. But like, if the store was closed, then the only way they'd be able to get in is if Ali had a key and let everyone in. She would also have to disable some sort of alarm. But Dez freely just pushes the door open, which makes me think that the store was in fact still open, possibly in its final moments before closing, hence the lack of people. So was the store actually just open with nobody on the sales floor? Isn't that like, a bad thing? Doesn't that open up endless possibilities of thievery? Also was Allie just walking around with no form of ID on her? She's wearing a dress. They clearly has zero pockets and she also doesn't have a purse. Where is her phone? Where is her wallet? Why am I taking this show so seriously? Oh well, Dwayne Wade asks if he can show Austin a song so they can perform it together at his next gig. Austin and Allie are about to say no, but then Dez drags them away before he can say anything. Dez explains that Dwayne has a tendency to get obsessed with things, but once he does them, he's able to move on. Basically confirming that Dwayne Wade in the Earth Prime Disney Channel universe is neurodivergent and has hyperfixations. Just like me, for real. They end up agreeing to let him show them the song, and yeah, it's horrible. In the practice room, they all have to decide who tells Dwayne that his song is absolute dog water. But instead, Ali suggests that they take the new song they just finished and trick Dwayne Wade into thinking that he wrote it. So they do just that. They change the key and the lyrics to the song, and Dwayne genuinely believes that he is the one that wrote it, even though Ali and Austin were basically writing it for him. Everyone gets ready for the performance as Austin gets up on stage and thanks all of his fans for supporting him. He then shouts out Dwayne Wade, crediting him as both songwriter and NBA superstar, and neither of those are true because Dwayne Wade was not a superstar in the year 2014. Together, Austin and Dwayne performed their new song, What We Are About. And, uh, it's definitely an Austin and Ally song. Let's show them what we're about. Na, 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 na. Na, 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 na. Fun fact, this episode is actually what made LeBron want to leave Miami. 
The two finish performing and thumbnail shot. After the performance, Dwayne tells the group that he is aware that he didn't actually write the song, but he is okay with it because he got the chance to be a rock star. Back at Sonic Boom, we find out that Dwayne's hyperfixation of Austin is over with. So now he's thrown out all of his Austin stuff and wait! Not only is this guy behind the checkout desk, but he also has a clipboard. There is another employee at Sonic Boom. How cool. Anyway, the episode ends with Dez admitting that he has a secret Austin Moon Shrine and Trish sitting on a chair that Jay sent her. I guess they're still dating. Don't really care though. Episode done. So I am not the biggest Austin and Allie fan. However, I actually do quite like this episode. And I really don't know why. I mean, Austin and Natalie has pretty likable characters, so I was never bothered by any of them whenever they were on screen. And giving Dwayne Wade a hyperfixation subplot is nuts, man. I did not see that coming, but I am all for it, I, I, I suppose. Yeah, this episode was kind of weird, but it gets a 7 out of 10 for me. Not bad at all. A decent episode to end this video with. Drink all of these episodes, I would probably say Sweet Life, Proud Family, Austin and Natalie, Hannah Montana, Jesse, and Farm, and Shake It Up. The first three I consider to be legitimately good episodes, the Hannah Montana one is just kind of mid, and the last three range from mediocre to straight up dog water. But regardless, I had a lot of fun making this video, believe it or not. It was actually one of the first videos I had planned all the way back when I did my multiverse video, but it took me a while to find the right episodes to review. It was cool to go back and revisit some of these episodes and watch some of them for the first time. And I plan on making more of these too, so make sure you're on the lookout. What I want to know is what your favorite episode from this video is. Let me know in the comments below. I'd also like to know what your favorite Disney Channel guest star episode is in general, even if I didn't talk about it in this video. If you liked the video, make sure you hit the like button and tell all of your friends and even a few of your enemies. And of course, make sure you are subscribed as well. I'm Mr. Nostalgia, and I'm out for now. Peace.